directly on the formats. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Gun Violence Prevention Commission. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I believe a couple of our commissioners will be joining us momentarily, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and have Angie call the roll. And then as others are able to join us, we'll just loop them into the meeting. Ms. Deck and Knight. Mr. Elliot Major. Here. Mr. Joe Cobb. Here. Rabbi Kathy Cohen. Ms. Nicole Ross. Ms. Shakira Williams. Ms. Stacy Shepherd. Here. Ms. Tasha Steele. Here. Pastor Tim Harvey. Here. And a quorum is present, so we will go ahead and get started. I believe you all received the minutes from our organizational meeting, and I want to thank uh, Decca Knight, our secretary, for uh, recording those and, and uh, sending them out. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to review them. If so, I'd entertain a motion to uh, receive the minutes as uh, presented. I make a motion, Stacy Shepard, that we accept the minutes. Second, Tasha Steele. Thank you, Stacy and Tasha. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion is passed uh, and the minutes are received. Uh, we'll move on to new business and uh, Nicole and, and uh, Kathy, welcome. Uh, we, we jumped on the roll call before you joined us, but we're glad that you're here. No problem. We count you all as present, so thank you. Um, First thing we're going to do this afternoon is just do spend a, a brief amount of time getting updates on our working groups. Um, we we do this on a regular basis, but I think it's important for uh, the public to know uh, what we're working on. Uh, we have five different working groups that focus on safer neighborhoods, education, gang violence reduction, and incarceration recidivism, rapid response, and city services and marketing and communications. And so I'm gonna just go through each of those uh, working groups. And if each of you uh, can just give a brief update on what we're working on, that will be helpful. Uh, first, uh, Safer Neighborhoods, Tim and uh, Nicole, thank you for your work on this. Um, I'll just let either of you give us a, a quick update on what your focus is right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And Nicole, jump in and um, cover anything I overlook. Um, our, our subcommittee has three tasks ahead of us, uh, probably chronologically. Uh, well, we've already completed the Little Blue Truck uh, book reading. And, and I think the next task with that will be to, to continue to work to get that into Roanoke City Public Schools classrooms. Uh, COVID has been a, a barrier there as it has with so many things of our lives. And so I, I especially think for next fall, we'll be in good position to, to have that resource available. Um, then we are looking at a, a, what would be a second memorial service for victims uh, of gun violence, but we don't wanna, we recognize that there would be victims of other sorts of violence as well. Uh, and we would be looking at a, uh, an event, a weekend event in, in late July, early August. Uh, probably for that it's parallel with the one that was happened in I, time flies was that the summer of 2018 or 19 19, 19. Um, 
along with that, then the construction of our mobile chalkboard. Uh, conceptually, that's easy. There's a few logistic things uh, that need to be worked out around that. You know, like who owns it in a manner of speaking to transport it from place to place and, and getting that scheduled. Uh, some of the logistics there, but as far as construction, it's, it's a fairly straightforward piece. Uh, which is phase one of our uh, long-term vision for fostering community conversations. And then uh, it is time to, to really begin thinking about uh, this December's bridging the community gap, uh, just laying the groundwork, getting some permits in place, uh, building those relationships with community groups and moving forward on that. Uh, it's, it, it won't be too long before we need to get that going in earnest. Nicole, would you add anything to that? Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions, uh, Tim? Some of the things that I'll bring up during, in the gang violence reduction effort um, have intersections with uh, the work you all are doing, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk further about that. Um, education, uh, Tasha, can you update us? Sure, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the education subgroup has been um, partnering with Family Service to uh, implement positive action as uh, the chosen curriculum as part of a community-wide effort for prevention. And um, so in our efforts, right now we are in a piloting phase. Um, that's four lessons with four different agencies, Boys and Girls Club, West End Center, Presbyterian Community Center, and Community Youth Program. Um, we have gotten some um, preliminary feedback, and overall, the pilot has been favorable with a few irregularities. We are planning to administer a survey um, once everything is complete. And at that point, once we have the data from the survey, we'll make a decision about moving forward with positive action. And uh, so we'll hopefully um, soon be able to share more information on that. And we had um, a pretty robust conversation about the need to do um, more training, more trauma-informed education training for our community. Um, Deca Knight, she's um, the co-chair with me and a couple of other people on our committee are also tapped into the trauma-informed community network. And we've been doing some trainings in the community, but we really want to make this um, a true community effort. So really going beyond the trauma basics and looking at ways that we can tailor this training for our youth and our families. Um, and then, you know, really looking at people connected with, with victims of gun violence and making sure that um, we are wrapping our arms around them with the, the trauma-informed support. Um, so we talked about that. We also talked about the need being the education committee, how important it is to inform the community on our purpose, the purpose of the commission. There's been a, a perception that we've just seen and we've heard in the community um, that we are the role, our role or our goal is to um, take away the sec people's second amendment rights. And so we just wanted to make sure that people understand exactly what our role is and, and what we're working towards. Um, DECA has actually created this infographic and um, it, it hasn't been adopted yet, but at some point we will um, hopefully release that so everyone can see and really be able to dispel some of the myths um, about what we've been hearing and seeing. Um, so those are the main pieces that we've been working on. Oh, there's one other thing, um, DECA and I, uh, we, we came together and we presented it to the team and everyone was, um, was on board in terms of having a presentation about language and how we um, talk about our children and, and not just our children, but people in the community using, um, making sure that we are using language that raises people up and not uses, using deficit language um, because our goal is to be part of the solution. We don't want to um, initiate or re-traumatize or, or harm um, anyone through all of our work and all of our efforts with the commission. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. And I, I think uh, Angie actually has the infographics um, she created uh, one large infographic, but then split it into three sections. And so I Perfect. think we're going to share the screen right now so you all can take a look at these. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So this is this is kind of the first part. Um, 
And this is something that could be easily shared out uh, through the city of Roanoke's Facebook page. Uh, this just lays out our mission very clearly. Uh, we can also uh, include in this, you know, ways to uh, uh, to reach out to the commission. Um, and it, it, it's an entry point for us to share specific action related items that we're working on. Uh, so go to the second one. All right, I probably should have left that up a little longer, but so this is just kind of a recap of some current initiatives uh, that we're focused on. It includes the reset work, uh, the rapid response work that we're focused on, the, the public art project, um, the, the uh, pilot program that you just mentioned, the basic trauma training workshops, upcoming community outreach events, which will be part of our community youth assessment. Um, that we'll we'll talk about further, and then um, partnerships uh, with local business community as well as workforce development on uh, creating employment opportunities uh, and mentoring opportunities for our youth. So the, the 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 nice thing about this design is that this can be updated and it, it can focus in on one or two things, or as as you see here, multiple things. Um, as a way of communicating the work that we're doing. And then there's a third, which I, I believe addresses some of the myths, uh, which you alluded to earlier. So we'll pull that one up. Uh, so the, these just lay them out fairly clearly. Um, our role is not to regulate gun ordinances in the city. Uh, the commission, uh, does not influence legislative policy. We work on root causes that contribute to violence. Um, we are not an extension of law enforcement. We do support the work of our reset team. We uh, are partners with law enforcement in terms of uh, gathering the data and working together uh, to reduce violence in our community. We're all committed to that. Um, and then, um, the idea that our commission's actions will be immediate and independent. Uh, the immediacy really has to do with uh, community support and, and how quickly we can generate and implement some of the, the plans that we're working on. But we recognize that if we're going to change systems, if we're going to change and shift uh, culture around violence and how to reduce violence, that is longer term and more complex work. And so I thought DECA did a really good job here of just identifying uh, some of the clear uh, concerns that, that we continue to hear and how to address those. And if you all uh, as a commission are supportive of these, we can start pushing these out as early as tomorrow uh, through the city's uh, Facebook page and other social media outlets. Are there... Uh, after seeing those, are there any um, additional things you would add at this point or additional information we should include, keeping in mind that uh, if we send these out individually, we should probably have uh, some contact information uh, or where people can access more information about the work we're doing on the dedicated uh, image. Uh, Joe, I thought the language that um, Becca used was wonderful. Uh, the points very, very well made, succinct, easy to understand. Um, the only thing I would mention is very picayune, and uh, that is where it does have contact mem uh, contact information. It lists you as council member. I think that should probably be Roanoke City Council member just in case uh, this particular document ends up moving beyond our locale. Well, it, it, we could just change it to commission chair as well, which, which would help address that issue. But that's a really good point. Yeah. And Joe, I too think these are, are fantastic uh, uh, graphic images and, and contain the information that we need to get out. I know when we, we last talked, I can't even remember what Congress, what what group of this I was with, um, but with our communications team, and and I know that the idea was pitched of uh, maybe 
doing some op-eds or articles with the Roanoke Times in collaboration there. And I, I can see writing an op-ed and, and, and seeing if, if they would even be so gracious as to include one or more of the images along with, the, along with that piece. Um, you know, just, just throw that out there. I, um, only to encourage even, even wider distribution of a, a really great image. Thank you, Tim. Stacy. Um, the only thing that I would add, and again, this is really just kind of being nitpicky, but the language is wonderful. The message um, house is wonderful. It just feels really dark and heavy to me. So, you know, if we're trying to express something and get people to look at it, sometimes a dark image of that nature is not going to bring someone to really view that. So um, it just feels heavy. Okay. I think that's I think that's wise. You know, one of the things we want to focus on is the violence that we're experiencing is heavy. Uh, it's impactful. It's life altering. It's traumatic, um, and we have to find multiple ways to communicate the work that we're doing and how to engage the community at large. Um, one of the things we'll talk about a little later in marketing and communications is we're working on a really comprehensive campaign uh, that includes multiple ways of marketing and communicating uh, this work and, and the, the, the point of reducing and ending violence in our community. And to do that, um, we, we want to dedicate uh, a significant uh, amount of budget to work with um, a local uh, a local business that specializes in communication and marketing. Uh, we have uh, some internal people in our city, uh, Melinda Mayo with our PR um, and communications, our community engagement manager, uh, Tiffany Bradbury. Uh, but this kind of dedicated campaign that we want to make visible in multiple ways that will reach multiple people, as many people as we can, um, needs to be strategic. Uh, it needs to be thought out. Um, it, you know, some of it's gonna be in people's faces, some of it's gonna be behind the scenes, um, but the, the nature of the work we're doing and kind of the insidious nature of violence is that it, it reaches people um, in ways that are not always visible. And uh, we see the effects of that, um, particularly uh, in the ways in which kids are uh, recruited for gangs, um, in, in the ways in which, uh, uh, you know, violence just infiltrates systems. Uh, and sometimes we don't know it until we're, we've experienced the effects of it. And so the importance of this being strategic is really critical. And um, so I think we'll be able to move fairly quickly as, as we finalize the plan. It's nearly finalized now. I think we're at the stage where we can, through the city, uh, send out an RFP um, describing what we're looking for and identify a local marketing uh, company that hopefully can not only give us uh, a very strategic and effective way to move forward, but also leverage um, some in-kind uh, services to help balance it out. So uh, I just want you to know that that is, uh, we're in the final stages of, of working on that. And this is just a piece of that, but it, it's critical that it all work together. But I think the, the focal point of this infographic is to get information out now about what we're doing and to let more people know what we're doing and how they can work with us um, to reduce violence. So I, I think um, we can incorporate those changes pretty easily. Um, we'll give DECA a little bit of time. Um, uh, so hopefully by, by later this week, we'll be able to finalize something. I'll send it back out to you all for review and then we can get it, um, get it out there through social media. So it sounds like general consensus is everything looks good, good information, 
Um, we may want to update the, uh, the contact information, look at uh, maybe an article that could go in the Times as well as the Tribune, um, along with the infographic image uh, to just supplement that work. And then also to look at how we could lighten the colors and uh, take away some of the heaviness of it. Okay. Those were all great suggestions. Did I capture everything there? Yes. Okay. Joe, I would be happy to, to offer to, to write the piece. There are certainly others who are even more capable and could do it better. So I, if others end up doing it, that's fine. Just if well, that Tim, is something that would be helpful, I'd be glad to do it. Tim, I'd encourage you to go ahead and get a, gra a draft started and, and we can all, we can all, uh, you can send it to us and we can chime in. And uh, sometimes the strength of all of our voices um, can make a really great article. Yeah, certainly it would be it would be authored by the group. Um, um, if, if if I could get an email copy of those images, it might be nice to have those in front of me as I'm writing. Yeah, we'll send them out to everybody. Okay. All right. Well, that was uh, the other thing I wanted to say too is that I know um, Tasha, we've reached out to uh, Roanoke City Public Schools in regard to um, the the effort that was done a couple of years ago to, to, to revise the effort around lock, locked guns, uh, save kids, and the accompanying uh, letter that went out to parents just to encourage parents to sign on to nonviolence. Um, I, I haven't heard definitively when that may be sent out. Uh, I know that uh, I was part of a conversation where there was some thought about whether to do it now uh, with SOL testing happening right now, they're, I, I think they're trying to figure out when is the best time to do that. Is that your sense? Yes, it is. And I'll get clarification on exactly when that's going out and report that back to the team, to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, gang violence reduction and incarceration recidivism. I guess that's me and Elliot. <laughs> Uh, we have been working really hard on a comprehensive uh, gang reduction model. Um, we've, the plan is really in place. Uh, we, we've temporarily set all of the pieces of that uh, to the side because we've been working on the youth and gang violence community assessment, um, which, and I'll go ahead and talk about that now. Um, Roanoke is one of seven localities in Virginia that is set to receive $25,000 to conduct a youth and gang violence community assessment um, this summer. Uh, we, we will have between the time we receive the funding until the end of September to conduct that uh, assessment. Uh, as part of the uh, documentation that we sent in, uh, we'll be working with either an individual consultant or an organizational consultant to help us um, create all of the steps for doing that assessment and making it as comprehensive as possible. Uh, I think the, the first and, and, and key voice that we want to hear is the voice of our youth. Um, and not only our youth, um, you know, as, as young as elementary, but particularly in middle school and high school where we're seeing the greatest impact, but also our young adults. Um, as we look at the data, uh, we are very clearly seeing that uh, victims and offenders are falling in the 12 to 29 age range. Um, and disproportionately, we're seeing it among African-American males. Um, so these are, you know, we want to hear from as many youth as possible, but we also want to make sure that we're reaching out through trusted mentors, uh, relationships that are focused on trust and that are safe places for the youth to, um, to share information. Uh, we have a template for surveys that will be developed as well as focus groups and um, youth summits and community events. We're looking, we'll be looking for partners to work alongside us to make sure this assessment is as, as thorough 
and uh, expansive as possible. We want to make sure that the sharing of this information is as equitable as possible. So we'll have an online survey, but we'll also have paper surveys. And um, I feel like we should also offer the opportunity for the surveys to be completed over the phone, uh, if that's the best way for, for people to do that. But just to make sure that we have all of that covered. So as soon as we get the, the funding, um, we'll announce that and I'll, you'll be the first ones to know about that. Um, so that's what we're focused on now. Uh, we're also focused on uh, some key initiatives around um, supporting mentoring programs in the community, supporting opportunity programs. These may be um, uh, youth and young adult employment opportunities. Um, we're reviewing uh, services that are currently provided for youth. And one of the things we're aware of is that we, we have a surplus. We, we are rich, as Elliot likes to say, we are rich in resources in the Roanoke Valley. We're, what we're not so good at is communicating all of those resources. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that the services that are out there and are available for our youth are being communicated and are being accessed in ways to reach as many youth as possible. We're also aware that young adults, um, that services tend to drop off after 18. And we want to make sure that if there are gaps uh, to reach young adults, particularly around opportunity, around mentoring, uh, job opportunities around mentoring, about connecting them with services that can help them get not just to the point of success, but to help them sustain that success. Uh, someone recently shared in court services that um, some of these, these funders want to see immediate success, but they don't create funding to continue the success. So they may be designed some programs to, to get somebody to uh, one year of success and then the funding stops and there's no way to continue it. We wanna be a city that provides a continuum so that that success is, is manifested over a longer term. And this is also true in, in the work that Elliot does. And uh, I know TAP is involved in this, but, but for folks who have been previously incarcerated, uh, in order to reduce that recidivism, What's critical is those first couple of years as someone is returning to the community, that they have this, A, the ability to get a job, B, that they have a support system, and C, that they're able to sustain um, that, that meaningful life that, that, that they want to live and contribute back to the community. Um, but realistically, that can't be done in a year. It, it, it has to be done over a longer period of time. And so it's a combination of those things that we've been working on in the gang violence reduction and incarceration recidivism. Uh, Elliot, is there anything else you would add to that? Uh, no, I think you summed it up um, quite nicely, by the way. I, I probably need you on my marketing team. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I think all that there, the only thing I, I you know, was, is worth reiterating is um the focus in on those young adults um and, and while there's a lot of resources out there um the drop off is severe once you become labeled quote unquote 18 years older um and that's in a lot of cases that's where it's needed the most um for what we're seeing and, you know people's lives can go sideways um, very quickly um and i you know personally i deal with that every day um very good people Valedictorians of high schools. Um, Ten years later, I'm, you know, they're coming through my organization. So, um, so something is missing. You know, there's a gap there somewhere, and uh, you know, we hope through all of these efforts that we can both prevent it, but then be in a position to course correct uh, some of our returning citizens as well. And, and part of this effort, um, there, some of the language that's used in. Um, in this prevention and intervention work is identifying in the community credible messengers. Uh, these are people who, um, 
who are trusted in the community, who have the training and the skills uh, to either mentor or uh, to work with uh, organizations in the city to work with our youth. Um, and this is a way potentially to incorporate uh, young adults and, and older adults. And, and by that, I mean, you know, uh, older than young adults uh, who, who have experienced um, a life that um, through a, a variety of circumstances maybe uh, led to acts of violence. And, and now they're, they're wanting to, they're disrupting that cycle and wanting to make a positive impact and, um, and work with our youth and young adults to, um, to share their stories and to, to change their perceptions of, of how they can respond to violence differently or resolve conflict differently. Um, so, so those are a lot of the pieces that we're looking at. Um, rapid response and city services. Stacy, could you give us an update, please? Yes. Um, we've been busy working with the group Fed Up um, on their articles of incorporation and working with the council um, to try to help them along to bring them into a nonprofit. Um, as part of our coordinated community response, the Fed Up group is um, really hope. Um, what will be as a, a core component of our coordinated response. Um, these are family members and um, community members who have themselves suffered um, a loved one or a friend to gun violence. And so as part of our coordinated response team, um, those members and those um, um, folks from Fed Up understand that process and what's to come afterwards and the the things that are needed and so we really want to help them along so that they can help us coordinate this community response the next thing i'll say is that um, aside from that we've really just been busy the last few weeks um, meeting the needs of the community so some of the members on the working group for the coordinated response have really been responding to the emergency needs of the community um, due to the recent uh, deaths that we've had um, and the gun violence that we've had. So it's really been about us um, meeting the needs of safety first and foremost, sheltering if that's become necessary, food, um, emotional support, advocacy supports. And so a lot of that is really what's been happening over the last couple of weeks for this working group is just responding to the sheer volume of what's been happening in our community, um, which has derailed some of our other work and plans. But again, that's that's what we're here for. That's that coordinated community response. The one um, plug that I would give to all this is that it is essential um, for us to grow that team and grow that community response team and we can't do this work with just a handful of people so um, having a group of people that care about what happens to others in our community and are willing to help in an emergency situation and help navigate some of those needs whatever those needs are or it is going to be make or break to the success of this community response group um, and a lot of people have been well intended and there's been a lot of um, folks that have said, you know, they would like to help, but that follow through is just very important so that in the middle of whatever incident comes, we have folks that we can call um, to help. And that might not necessarily mean that they're coming out to the scene or that they're coming to the hospital or wherever that need is it may mean making a few phone calls on behalf of the coordinated response team but we really do need to grow that team and make it um, a much larger response because we know that if we don't um, what we're seeing in our community is that trauma begets trauma and so if we don't respond and we don't do something in that moment and help the families and the other children and the secondary um, victims and survivors in these instances, 
then it's just going to cause additional um, issues on down the road. And so I just can't stress how important the response team can be um, for trying to address trauma in that moment. Um, and I do appreciate the education committee and marketing committee um, really addressing the myth around our commission. Um, we really are, um, and the, I know I can speak for our working group, we are really passionate to make sure that the focus stays on responding to that trauma and meeting the needs of the trauma um, so that we don't have future issues with violence. Thank you, Stacy. So it sounds like uh, one of the, the things that would be helpful is to solidify our community partners as part of the coordinated rapid response, uh, as well as uh, just the, the specific steps of protocol. Some of that's already in place because of the responding that we're doing. And then I would say, thirdly, we, we may want to finalize a volunteer application so that we could push that out so that people in the community who are interested in, in working with FedUp or, or with as part of our coordinated response or us, uh, they could begin submitting their information and we could begin building that team. Does that sound like our, our key steps right now? I definitely think those um, partnerships are going to be key to the success and identifying who those partners are. Um, because I think that's a little loosey goosey right now. And I think that solidifying those partnerships is the key step. Okay. I think some of our churches are really looking at how they can support. So this would be a good time to get something in the hands of those pastors because everyone is feeling the effects of it. So I think we're in good time to recruit volunteers um, while it's fresh. And while you know it's on top of mind to everyone, I think you're in a good time frame to do that. And did you guys have a? Did I see a commercial about the rapid response team? No, that, that was the collective for opioids. Um, okay, I was like, I remember seeing a commercial, but it was really good. I thought I saw your face. Yeah, no, it is a good commercial. It was. <laughs> well, and and that's that. Just as a side note, is what we want to do. Move quickly on. Uh, this summer so that um, there are commercials, there are social media posts, there are ads, there are billboards focused on the, the this, this comprehensive approach to reducing violence in the community. Um, Stacy, I, I would suggest that I know we're finalizing a, a brochure that includes resources for families that we work with. I'm wondering if we could also develop a simple one, one sheet that describes how people can be partners with us in this work. So if, if you're a, a faith-based organization, here are the expectations, here, here's what you can do. And then, and then as Nicole said, the congregations can identify, this is realistic for us. Maybe this one, this piece of it isn't, but this is a way we can intersect. Um, I, I think that would be helpful. I do too, and I'm happy to work on that invitation um, to folks to join our response team. Great, thank you, Stacy. All right. Um, and I've, I've really already talked about marketing and communications, so, so we'll move on from that. Um, I, I wanted to say, just give a reminder on our working group meetings. Um, Angie, whom you all know, is, is here to um, help you do the scheduling for the working group meetings. Um, it, it, when at all possible, it, it helps us. If she can be involved in that, she can automatically get those meetings on the city's calendar. Um, if we want to do alerts about the meetings or share information, she can easily do that. She can help uh, make sure that agendas are prepared and, and minutes collected so that then those can be archived on our webpage on the city's website. Um, she has a list of all the working group members. So I would encourage you to utilize her willingness to help us. 
Um, I know that the Education Committee has met. I know that uh, the Gang Violence Working Group uh, has met. I know that Safer Neighborhoods is, is trying to, to set up a meeting. So um, Stacy, for you and um, uh, Tasha, uh, just please know, everybody know that Angie's here to help facilitate that. And, and that can take some things off your plate in terms of trying to reach out to folks and find the best time to meet. So um, I'd encourage you to connect with her and um, uh, she's here to help us. Thank you. All right, we'll move down to funding updates. Uh, we've got a, a lot of, this is kind of the, the second heart of what we're talking about tonight. Um, one of the things that we are hearing from the community is so many people you know, want to see something happen right now. What can we do right now? Um, and, and this is true every time there's an incident. I, I can tell you all from, from when I really began to invest myself more fully in this a couple of years ago, um, every time I hear of an incident of gun violence, I just, I break because I'm thinking about the person who was the victim, the person who was the offender, the family, the, uh, the peers, uh, the neighbors, the city, um, certainly in, in, in cities that are larger than ours, um, the number of, of cases of gun violence and violence in general is larger, the numbers are bigger, but I can tell you all, and you all know this firsthand, the impact in Roanoke is substantial. And um, so in part of our effort, we, we want to do what we can in the short term, but we also want to see in the long term uh, the effects of, of our work reducing gun violence and in, engaging the community in that. So, once we get the funding, um, we'll, and that should be any time, uh, we'll, we'll be moving ahead with the Youth and Gang Violence Community Assessment. Uh, we have a grant writing team uh, that is working on a uh, gun violence intervention program grant through the state. We are one of the localities that's eligible to apply for this because of the General Assembly uh, legislation and funding, and we would directly use our findings from the community youth assessment in uh, these prevention and intervention efforts. So I wanted to just tell you briefly, we're, we're meeting again this week to finalize the grant. Uh, I'll send it out to you all so you can take a look at it before we, uh, the deadline is uh, Monday the 17th. So we'll want your input uh, on it. But there are several things that we can ask funding for in this grant, both personnel, personnel is one area. And then the second area is prevention and intervention programs that work alongside and with community-based organizations. So under personnel, at this point, we are asking for a full-time, we're ask, actually asking for three full-time positions in personnel. One is a youth and gang violence prevention coordinator for the city. We are also asking for two street outreach um, personnel that would work both with this youth violence prevention coordinator as well as the reset coordinator. Um, and that all three of these would work through the city uh, to build partnerships and relationships in a direct outreach to our youth in the community. Um, under the uh, prevention and intervention, we're looking at kind of five key category areas, and I want to share those with you now. And a lot of this is based on what we're hearing. And um, one is, it goes directly to the point that Tasha made earlier. Uh, we want to educate, train, and advocate uh, on trauma-informed learning. One of the things that, that I'm becoming aware of is that kids who are in school today 
are children of parents who experience trauma, much of it related to gun violence 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And if the trauma is never addressed, there can never be a pathway to healing. There can never be a breaking of the cycle. And so as, as Tasha said, we want to make sure there is funding that's prevention and intervention based that focuses on trauma, being trauma informed and how to utilize what we know to provide healing and to help change that cycle. That's number one. Number two, we wanna provide conflict resolution training for citizens in our community who are what I described earlier as credible messengers. Um, these are people in our neighborhoods, uh, in our city, who work with youth, who work with families, who have that trusting relationship already established, uh, who are willing to receive this training to be on call, essentially, when there is a situation of conflict and to be able to not only intervene and stop the conflict or provide an alternative uh, resolution that's nonviolent, but also to help us train others and to teach kids, youth and young adults, the value of knowing how to pause and look at a conflict differently or even anticipate a conflict differently and to seek resolution in a positive way. The third area is we wanna support mentoring programs in our city. We have some extraordinary mentoring programs that start as early as elementary school and go through high school. Many of these mentoring programs are training young adults and middle-aged adults to be uh, mentors. And we want to support those efforts because uh, there is very clear evidence uh, not only in this, but in these other programs I mentioned, that these do prevent, these intervene, they interrupt violence, and they also prevent it in the future from happening again, because they're focused on helping kids see the opportunities they have in their lives. And if kids don't see they have opportunity, they're going to turn to the things that, that can just get them through each day. And for too many of our kids, it's survival and really for too many of our families. Um, we're also looking at expanding an urban farm initiative. And, and this would be a way to teach kids um, how to plant, grow, harvest, and sell produce. And one of the ways we're looking at, uh, we would like to partner with the housing authority uh, in their communities and in other neighborhoods that, that where we're seeing a higher rate of crime. Uh, this is one example of an entrepreneurial program that can potentially engage youth and their families uh, in, in growing produce, not only for themselves, but for their neighbors and to teach them entrepreneurial skills in the process. Now, there are multiple programs out there in our city that are teaching kids about being entrepreneurs and we wanna find a way to support those, but this is a very specific kind of initiative with multiple partners that we, be, we believe we could launch very quickly. And then the, the fifth category is youth employment opportunities. And, and part of this is teaming with businesses, uh, with workforce development resources, um, with local uh, mentoring programs that are teaching entrepreneurial skills, but to to broaden the, the scope of employment opportunities that are available for youth and young adults, um, to provide structure, to provide uh, a focus, to provide income. And uh, all of these can be not only deterrents uh, to violence, but they can um, help people have see opportunity in their lives. So those are the five kind of category areas we're looking at for the other piece of the funding. If we get the grant, it would be for up to $500,000, which would cover two years. So it'd be 250,000 per year. And it would be a combination of supporting the personnel 
the, the jobs that I mentioned, as well as the community-based organizations. So once that grant is uh, the narrative and the, the, the goals are finished up and we anticipate finishing those up Thursday, um, I will send those back out to you for you all to review and give your insights. But I, I wanted to share that with you and then see if you have any uh, initial feedback. Do those goals, uh, do those five areas sound um, like we're on the right track? Uh, do we need to, to rethink any of them? What are your thoughts? I love them. I, I think they're right on. And I wanted to ask a question about the Urban Farm Initiative. Um, are you only looking to do that in the um, housing authority areas or are you looking for other spaces? Anywhere. There is a location that I know of that's open because that's where Goodwill, our mentoring program used to do a garden. It's right on Shenandoah. Um, it right where the, um, what is it? What's the name of those? The Getty Mart right there. That space is a great big open field. It's owned, the, the land is owned by Steel Dynamics. They don't care what happens up there as long as it's positive. The field is already um, there. The, we, put, we build a pavilion where there are picnic tables. The goal was to have a community garden, which we did, but Goodwill decided to do away with it after we lost the funding, which I'm still upset about. But anyway, that garden is there. Um, it just would need a little love and care and nothing's growing in there now of course but the um the fencing is already up and that would be a great place to kind of rehab um it it would be great it's a creek right there i mean it's just a wonderful location there's a even a produce stand there where you could step sell from because that was that that was the initial um initiative of that program so if you guys want to take a look at that space i think that would be a great opportunity to bring some life back into that and it's still right in the northwest um community i believe that's right at the corner of 24th and salem not the one not the okay. Goodwill Garden, but okay. it's up the street. It's up by Peters Creek Road, um, where West, okay. Creek, West Creek Manor, I believe it is, Cherry okay. Hill, the right. Cherry Hill neighborhood. And it's it's a wonderful space. I mean, it's, it, it grooms, you know, family gatherings. It's a really nice space. So you may want to take a look at that. And it's it would just need a little bit of work to um, get that back going. Great, great. Yeah, we'll be looking for locations um, at, that are easily accessible by youth and families that live in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, we want it to be something that you can walk to um, from, from where you live. And um, that is an outreach. It's an opportunity for, for events, as you said, for education. Yeah. And um, there, there are a lot of great community partners that are, all, you know, are willing to, to do this kind of effort. And um, uh, as a side note, this, this was a, a I don't think he saw it as well. He did see it as a legacy, but but we lost him too soon. And this was kind of a lifelong work of John Lewis. Um, so this this is a way to not only honor him, but to to remember those we've lost to gun violence and to do something that that honors their lives in such a way that it that it brings forth possibility and renewal. Any other uh, recommendations or comments on on that before we? Hey, Joe, not, not to belabor the, the, the last point, um, but I, I do feel that uh, I would definitely like to explore uh, point number five. I, I think that's a that's a prime um, opportunity um, within the communities and within the city itself um, to develop more business minded uh, entrepreneurial. Um, youth, you know, going as we move forward. Um, and, and I would say, you know, how do we even work on getting that into the school systems um, to be able to teach those types of skills? Um, and then you can, you know, do things like, you know, incubators, you know, small micro incubators um, for these types of opportunities. Um, but I also want to say, look at more, um, if I had one input, which, which I kind of talked to the people at Goodwill, um, let's look at the labor force of the future when we come to these types of job training and initiatives and entrepreneurial things. You know, I would love to see things more like coding um, within those communities. Um, you know, people looking at more international 
um, aspects of, of, you know, taking advantage of, of, you know, modern day logistics. And you can be anywhere and sell any place in this world right now uh, and just move. How do we teach them to move out of the traditional uh, mindset into, you know, what's going to be there for 15 years from now? You know, what's going to be there for 20 years from now? Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's, I think that's a, that of all the, of all the five that you talk about, um, I think will play in a, in a very important part in changing the dynamics um, and the culture of some of our you know, most affected communities. You know, and how, how do we teach that? You know, uh, because you, you know, more people, if a child is growing up and they don't even know economics or they don't even know business or it's not talked about in their home, that's, that's not a transferable skill that they're just gonna pick up later on. You know what I'm saying? People are groomed into these types of things. You know, and so we got to figure out with our youth, how do we groom that next generation uh, with that mindset? Um, and, and I'll say this again and, and leave it alone, um, but I would all, almost augment mentorship with sponsorship as well. I remember reading, a, uh, I was doing a study, well, I don't, don't want to recap everything, um, about uh, females in the workforce. And one book um, doing my research was, find a sponsor, not a mentor. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we start looking at people and what we want to do with these youth, we have to find sponsorship, people who are willing, when you talk about long-term sustainability, you know what I'm saying? You, put it this way, the mentor can motivate you, the sponsor can enable you. And I, and I think we've got to think about businesses, people in this community who can literally sponsor segments to be able to make sure that they've got the resources education um, and the support um, again not year one year two or 90 days but how do we keep them going over here so if you know within that mentorship um, i would like to explore that a little bit more what does that really mean how is that going to be created um, and then on the on item number five um, definitely thinking about um, you know the future of business and what does it look like and how do we translate that back down to some of our youth now. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point because one of the barriers that we see, particularly in communities of color, is a lack of access to capital. Uh, understanding how that works, how to build it, how to grow it. Um, it's all part of being an entrepreneur. Um, so I think that's a really good point. And, and, and I think, um, I, I know we have, dedicated uh, people in the business community that uh, understand that and, and would like to be supportive of that. They're just looking for an opportunity to be supportive. All right, um, so I wanna move on to the, the, the last major part here, which um, we, uh, in the current budget year, fiscal year uh, 2021, we have $75,000 um, dedicated to uh, the work of this commission. And uh, we currently have expended uh, $500 for the production of the Little Blue Truck video, which will go into the schools. And um, we approved funding for the Positive Action Curriculum Pilot Program, but because that was already covered under some uh, already existing funding, we don't have that as an expense. Um, we uh, need to approve tonight uh, as part of the overall package. Um, I've been working with DECA to schedule two basic trauma training seminars um, that will be offered this summer. Uh, we can, the total to do those is $1,000, so 500 for each. Those will be you know, community-wide, we'll send out information about how people can register for that. Um, so that essentially leaves about $73,500 for our consideration and how we want to uh, expend these dollars. And there are a, a, a number of things I'd like for us to consider. Um, and I'm just pulling up my, my notes on this. So bear with me a minute. So 
So I sent you out earlier um, a, a criteria sheet for us to do um, mini grants for um, nonprofits um, and potentially uh, not uh, faith-based organizations. Um, and we can determine the range and uh, of the grants as well as the overall amount that we'd like to set aside in the grants. Um, Tim Spencer is here with us uh, from our, he's our city attorney. And Tim, thank you for being here. Sure. Um, I, I wanted Tim to talk with us a little bit about the process, um, what this would look like in terms of, you know, with, with nonprofit organizations, there's, there's one kind of agreement that you have. If we're able to work with faith-based organizations, there's probably another, a different kind of agreement. And all of these funds, and what we're looking at doing, if we approve this tonight, is that we would post an application tomorrow uh, that would be open until May 21st. And um, following that, we would meet again as a commission, either the 24th or 25th, and uh, approve the grants. And then the checks could go out to the uh, approved eligible organizations uh, before the end of May so that they could be utilized and expended during the month of June. So this is a very proactive, short-term way that organizations in our community could uh, either support programs they already have that, uh, that evidence prevention or intervention uh, in reducing gun violence, or um, to support new initiatives that they may have. Um, so Tim, I'll, I'll shift over to let you share with us now. And then Angie, if you could bring up the criteria sheet so we could show that. Tim, thank you again for being here tonight. What can you share with us? Real quickly, what I can share is in general, you cannot use government funds to promote religious activity for religious-based organizations. But that doesn't mean that religious organizations are precluded from all grants. And in fact, there have been several cases that say, if it's the type of grant that would facilitate an activity that's non-religious in nature, say community um, playground equipment for uh, daycare centers, then even if it's a religious organization, they should be able to compete for that grant the same as a non-religious organization, since it's not to promote the religious activity, but it is to promote uh, physical activity in that instance uh, for playground equipment. So as we look at the nature of what you're hoping to achieve in the form of these grants, we can perhaps make it open to those faith-based organizations. As long as we're not, the, the money, the governmental money is not being utilized to promote or enhance uh, a religious message. That's kind of the fine line, but we have to, I have to know more about exactly what you're hoping to achieve in the grant money as to who can participate and whether we can include those faith-based organizations. Let me give one example that you might want to do. Say, for example, you were going to use this grant to have an organization promote a community dinner to reach out on the uh, effects of gun violence in the community. Well, what if Acts 2 Ministries, for example, wanted to take its youth, which are highly affected, and do that? We would have to look at it and say, is this going to be utilized to enhance your religious message, or is this a community message? And we would have to evaluate that as to whether the faith-based faith organization, such as Straight Street or Acts 2 Ministries, could 
be eligible for these grants. In either case, one thing that we should do is like we did with the CARES Act, and Angie worked hard on that, is have agreements so that we can ensure that the grant funds are being utilized for the purpose for which they're intended. All right, that, thank you. Sure and, thing. Tim, it's also my understanding that um, a, a nonprofit organization, uh, there's a distinction between a nonprofit organization and a 501c3, and that um, if a nonprofit doesn't have a 501c3, that wouldn't preclude them from applying. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, but they still must be properly registered and recognized as a nonprofit because there are 501c and there's a whole alphabet right. that you can have to, to be included in that. So we would look through that would be part of the process to ensure that the funds are going to an appropriate organization. Now, in regard to neighborhood organizations or groups, um, I know that some of our neighborhood organizations are registered as nonprofits or 501Cs. And many of them are not. Um, does, what, what are the guidelines for neighborhood organizations if they uh, were interested in, in this? Uh, this is one of those things also that as we look at equity and we're moving forward in this area uh, when it comes to youth sports is are we going to help our neighborhood organizations who haven't properly registered get registered? Um, I, I'm seeing some heads nodding. I think that that would be an appropriate way because then your more fluent neighborhood organizations might have an advantage over your less affluent. And so I think that what we do want to do is, is make sure that they're properly registered as nonprofits but we want to also give them the tools to become properly registered so that they can participate. That way we're reaching everyone and we're not, we're trying to take down any impediments from moving forward and having the benefit of these grant funds. And, and I would say to you all, this is in many ways a pilot uh, for us to do this and something that we could continue in subsequent years. Um, so I, I think it, it, it would be a really uh, excellent use of some of these funds. And I just want us to be clear on um, the criteria and eligibility um, so that, you know, especially since we're moving rather quickly on this um, and we have good support here in the, in, the, in the city in terms of helping us navigate uh, these different questions. So I wanna thank Tim and Angie uh, and Tiffany uh, for, for helping us with this. Uh, I'm gonna have Angie pull, post, pull up now the, uh, the criteria that I sent you earlier. Um, again, we'll, we'll tweak this based on the information that we have. Um, so, and, and I'll just read through this really quickly. The Gun Violence Prevention Commission is making available, and I put in $30,000, but as I said before, we have about 73,500 that, you know, we can raise that amount, or as we talk about other considerations, uh, we may come back to this amount. Um, so just put a bookmark there. Um, to local, uh, Organizations, we'll, we'll clearly define that, for activities designed for prevention and intervention of gun violence in our community. The commission is particularly interested in programs that work with youth and young adults. These funds will be distributed in grants of up to, we can do a set amount or we can do a range uh, and give the organizations opportunity if they have, you know, give them some flexibility in that range. Uh, for activities during the month of June 2021. Prevention and intervention efforts may include mentoring, education, conflict resolution training, uh, scholarships uh, to existing programs, programs and events. Um, we could add here uh, 
youth employment opportunity support. That, that's another category. This is just to give potential applicants uh, an idea of what we're looking for. Uh, the eligibility uh, would be, they must be located within the city of Roanoke and be nonprofit. Uh, and I suppose here we could say 501C or registered in good standing with the Commonwealth of Virginia, the city of Roanoke and the federal government. I don't know that we need federal government here. Um, some of this language I pulled from the CARES Act funding. Uh, Self-certification uh, organizations will be asked to self-certify that the expenditures for which they are applying are documented with documentation maintained on file at the organization. That will be part of the reporting back uh, at the conclusion of the grant cycle. Um, the deadline for when applications can be received and what they will need to upload. And then the contact information uh, with further questions or additional guidance. So let's scroll back up, uh, Angie. Are there other things you all would list in the uh, under prevention and intervention efforts may include? Could we, in, oh, I see you said conflict resolution training. Could we do something, other types of training? Because that seems to me like we could even do some trauma informed trainings if we open up the facilities. Sure. Um, just more. Yeah. Broaden the trainings that we could use. Right. Uh, we could say training, and yes. then we could include in parentheses conflict resolution, trauma informed, etc. Okay. Um, I would go back to what Elliot said, and where it says mentoring, uh, I would put mentoring and sponsoring. Okay. And I also wonder in terms of training, it, it's a little bit hard if they have to use the money in June, but if it's throughout the summer, if uh, that could not include some employment training as well. The challenge with this funding is that it has to be expended in June and it has to be reported by the end of June. Okay. That, that unfortunately is the, uh, uh, are, are the stipulations. Now, because this is a pilot uh, going forward, we could do this kind of effort earlier next year and it could be throughout the year. Yeah, okay. Hey Joe, um, I've, got, I've got a hard stop in about two minutes, uh, but I wanted to ask the question because, I mean, you kind of was a nice segue into this, because it's a hard, uh, uh, timeline on this over here. Oh, I want to say, how do we make sure that we're communicating and getting this out to all parties that could participate? You know, I, you know, you, you don't want to have this amount of funds available, this amount of effort, and we don't know enough about it. You know, and I, this is my point of just making sure that we can communicate this as quickly as possible because these are some tight timelines both in the application submittal process and the time that you have to utilize the fund? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, in addition to social media, uh, we will submit this to both newspapers um, so that they have the information. Uh, we will, um, we, we also have a pretty extensive uh, email list for nonprofit organizations in the city that we can send this out to. Um, and we, and we're open to other ways to communicating it. Those, those are kind of the, you know, the, the fast and quick ways that I know of that, that address a pretty comprehensive list of our nonprofit organizations in the community, as well as neighborhood organizations and faith-based organizations. Should we agree to do that? This could be a good conversation, um, Tim, if we could communicate it. We had talked before about um, sharing and meeting with those neighborhood programs, neighborhood organizations, 
if we could get that list that we have been working on and, and share it with that list, I think we could reach those neighborhood organizations if we decide to incorporate and include them. It certainly could, yeah. Well, and, and we can work with Josh Johnson, our neighborhood services coordinator to get the word out to the organizations if, if, if we wanna include them in this cycle. Um, I, I like uh, Tim Spencer's idea of empowering uh, neighborhood organizations to become registered uh, and, and, and supporting funding for that. Um, but, but this, at, at, as we said, is a very, uh, a very quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. So we wanna, we wanna reach, I, I think in part, we want to reach out to organizations that are already doing some of this work and support them in their efforts and uh, encourage them to include an educational component in what they're doing uh, that addresses reducing gun violence. And to um, speak to what Rabbi said, I believe that I don't think it's too short of a window to do the youth employment training because we do have time to catch them before they get out of school. We could put that information out and do some type of a, um, you know, summit or something quick where I know when I was at Goodwill, we were able to do those summer employment trainings in the month of May to get them employed in June. So I, that is something that I think is, is possible. It's possible, right, okay. Yeah. Um, so before we, and, and I, I, this is a lot to consider uh, and I appreciate your, your ability to stay uh, with it a little longer. Um, I did wanna ask, there were some other considerations that we were looking at and, and I just simply didn't know the answers to these. Um, so one of the things we've talked about, um, we, we could benefit from a dedicated grant writer, researcher, uh, writer, and monitor for our work. Um, obviously, this would just be providing funding for the month of June to have somebody do that. And, and, and I would think they would probably just be able to get started on the research aspect uh, of grants that are out there. But if that's something that we would like to fund, um, that's something we need to consider tonight. Uh, if there are any costs related to um, working with Fed Up um, uh, to get there, uh, to, to assist, assist them, we would need to know that. Um, Stacy, you mentioned, um, you know, working with a number of families on um, sh safety, shelter, food, advocacy. Uh, are there any anticipated uh, expend expenditures that we would want to set aside to expend before the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, to help with the rap coordinated rapid response? And then the other piece is marketing and communications. I, I'm, I'm realistic enough to believe that even if we craft an RFP uh, to connect with a local marketing firm, uh, we're not likely to have any kind of comprehensive rollout of a campaign by the end of June. I just, I, I'm not sure that that's realistic. Um, so that could be funding we could dedicate in next year's cycle of funding, um, but we could, activate something, you know, relatively soon in the next three or four months. So those, those are the things that I'm aware of as considerations. And I would like to hear from you all um, how much of this we wanna to dedicate to these quick turnaround grants, mini grants, and how much of this uh, we want to designate for some of these other areas. Joe, I'm just sitting here thinking that for a um, memorial service that we're talking about in, in July, you know, it's always a question of what we ask people to volunteer their time for and what we, you know, try to compensate through an honorarium for. Um, and that can get a little ticklish. But I, I know, you know, finding musicians and things in the summer, sometimes you can find people very quickly and sometimes it's it's a little hard. So I don't know if this would be a place to talk about that or... Um, 
would, we would not need a great deal of money, but um, something to consider. Yeah, we, the, when we did this, the event in 2019, I believe everyone volunteered their time. Uh, the, the school volunteered their space, uh, d essentially donated their space. Um, right. So, but I do think if we wanted to set aside some, again, this would need to be expended by the end of June. So even if it was for an event in July or August, if it was utilized for uh, facility, um, you know, reserving facility space, um, you know, solidifying uh, speakers um, and, and providing honorariums, um, I, I would say, I, you know, we could set aside $500, we could set aside $1,000. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that it would need to be any more than that. I, I would agree. Um, spending again, spending it in June might be the. Uh, yeah, that's what we're up against here. So no, I know I understand. I understand. Yeah. Stacy, do you have uh, any thoughts on costs for uh, getting fed up through their process that might be expended by the end of June? I don't, but I will definitely do some research on that and see what the cost or invoicing would be. Um, we had not gotten to the cost piece just as of yet, but I, I know that there is some. Okay. Um, the other thing with the cost of sheltering and safety, I would say it would be a good idea to, to leave at least $1,000 in there, maybe $2,000 um, for emergency needs. Um, the average week of shelter for um, a family, which would be one room, is about $900. Um, and that does not include food. So I would say at least you need to look at $1,000, um, maybe $2,000, you know, if we have multiple incidents like we've had lately. Okay. And uh, what about uh, contracting with the grant writer? Is that something you all would like to see us pursue in June to get started in that process? Yeah, I think, I think that's necessary. Yeah, for us to continue, um, like Nicole said, it's going to definitely be necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other area was um, marketing. Marketing. I'm in agreement with you, Joe. I think it'll be a push to get it done that quickly and we make it better, allocate those funds and expend them somewhere else um, okay. quickly. So what I'd like to suggest then is that we, um, set aside uh, $7,000 uh, for, uh, costs for Rona for members, uh, any preliminary costs. Uh, if that's not utilized for that, we can have it available for the sheltering and safety as part of coordinated rapid response. Um, the uh, grant writer position, um, again, we can, we can send out a contract, but I put in $2,000 just as a, a holding place for that. Um, and then what, whatever the costs are for fed up, which, which I think would be, you know, we could put a thousand in for that just to have some buffer, which uh, all of that being said would leave us with um, about $65,000 that we could, we could disperse in many grants. And we could do a range of three to five thousand dollars for applications, and then we, based on the applications we get, we could determine which ones are eligible, and the number that we could support, and then determine the amount of the grant. Is that is that amenable to you all? That's. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I just I have one quick question. Who, who is going to, who's responsible for reviewing the applications? Would it be the commission? Yes. Okay. It'll be the commission. Once we, once we reach the deadline, um, Angie and I will uh, 
collate all of the applications and we'll send them out to you as commissioners to review. And then at our special called meeting on the 24th or 25th, we'll determine that. Um, we, we will announce, uh, review and announce those applications in the grants. Okay. Sounds so good. I would need a motion uh, to uh, approve these budget expenses, including uh, up to $65,000 for many grants. Um, and then 8,000 uh, for the items that we specified, uh, which would uh, close out our, our, our budget for this year. I so move. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion is passed. Um, I will work with Angie. Uh, actually, I'll work with Tiffany. And Andy's away tomorrow. Um, I'll work with Tiffany to finalize the criteria and the application. And um, we will, hopefully we can get that finalized by tomorrow afternoon and posted. And we'll, we'll look at the multiple ways of posting that and sharing that information out to the organizations. And we'll also, before we send anything, We'll do a final um, uh, confirmation with Tim, Tim's office, the city attorney's office to make sure we've got everything covered from the legal end. All right, is Tim, does that sound good? That sounds good. I've already sent some emails and folded Laura in. Angie, you're not gonna be in tomorrow? I'm not going to be in tomorrow. I'll have access to email, um, but I, I can definitely work with Laura on that. We we handle the CARES Act stuff, so we'll, we can handle exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, so I just folded Laura in, and we'll be working together to get on this first thing in the morning. Yeah, and just loop me and Tim, and and we'll that way we can get everything taken care of. Okay. All right. Um, I think that is all of our business. Great meeting, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for your, uh, your participation tonight. Our next commission meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, June 8th at uh, 5.45 p.m. Uh, we will have a special called meeting the week of the 24th, and I will reach out to you all to determine which of those days will work best for everybody. All right? All right. All right. Our meeting's adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.